Okay, species of conservation concern. Uh, surveys and monitoring of the southern Wasatch Plateau. So the SEC list came about um, after what we had as the Forest Service, the regional foresters list. And for the region four, or on the Manti LaSalle, we had 16 sensitive plants on that list. And the, the 19, um, or excuse me, the 2012 planning rule gave way to um, the forest plan of vision. It also created an avenue to create the species of conservation concern list, um, thereby getting rid of the regional forester list. And uh, the definition of the SEC is a species other than federally recognized uh, threatened, endangered, proposed, or candidate species known to occur in the plan area and for which the regional forester has determined that the best available scientific information indicates substantial concern about the species capacity to persist over the long term in the plan area. And so with the caveat in that, there is a substantial concern also if we do not have a significant amount of data to show impacts to these plants. So therefore, we have 32 plants that are on the SEC list. Um, not all of them, but a lot of them are there because we don't have this information. And so the limited amount of time that I was giving to do some of these surveys, I've, I've chose a couple and this is what I will be talking about. Um, So I'll be mostly talking about Packer musiensis, which is also synonymous with Senecios, as you all probably know. Um, Packer musiensis is rated S1, G1, which is critically imperiled, uh, very high risk of extinction. They are known to occur only on the southern Was Wasatch Plateau in the Flagstaff limestone colluvium. Um, looking at resources, I've noticed uh, they only have it down for Sand Peak County, but as you'll see in my surveys, we've added another county in there. Um, the other species I'll talk about is Erigeron untermanii. Um, this is up for debate, but um, I'm not sure who, who did this or how it came about. But this was combined with uh, Erigeron carantonii. So originally in the Utah flora, Erigeron untermanii was located up in the Uintas, uh, Duchesne County, areas like that. Uh, and Erigeron carantonii was, was strictly on the, the Wasatch Plateau. Um, and let's see, so that's a S2, G2, considered imperiled at high risk of a sphinx, extinction. Um, and you'll see from my surveys that we definitely do see, I guess, a broader range of Ridgeron untermanii versus the Packer of New Census. So um, my primary job as the botanist on the Manti LaSalle uh, was long-term range uh, monitoring. And so I didn't get to spend a whole lot of time doing uh, SEC surveys, but I did get some time. And this was the area that I focused on. And you can see here in the yellow polygons, these are my 2018, 2019 surveys. Um, these were, these surveys were chosen based on existing occurrences identified through our Forest Service NRM TSP database. And also just kind of looking at similar habitat to those occurrences. Um, so that's how those were chose, but let me zoom out just a little bit. Um, this, if nobody can tell, this is on the Southern Wasatch Plateau, just east of Sterling and Mayfield and west of the town of Emory and um, kind of borders down by the Fish Lake National Forest, just to give an idea of where we're talking. Okay. Pacromusensis, uh, perennial rhizominous herb, mainly five to 10 centimeters tall, uh, glaucus and densely tomentose, pinnately lobed, 
inflorescence with three to several heads, corimbo structure. Uh, here's the interesting thing is that the ray flowers usually are lacking, but you'll see uh, one to two ray flowers on them. And they're similar to Senecio canis and Senecio multilobatus, with the exception of a well-developed uh, solubule, which is a, a, a shoot arising from a root. And it also differs in the spiraling radiate head. Um, these are endemic to the Flagstaff limestone on the Wasatch Plateau, not found anywhere else. Here's a couple pictures of Pacramisiensis. As you can see, you've got the, the Glaucus, Tomentos leaves, and you also can see in this right picture, there's your one to two ray flowers that, that give, the, give this species away. And then obviously you can see down below the, the limestone substrate and surface fragments. Okay, Pacromucensis habitat, uh, mostly found on barren and steep slopes in the Flagstaff limestone. I'll talk more about the soil properties later, but you can quickly see that on our A horizon in the right picture, it's mostly comprised of pavement and gravel sized fragments. Um, and then in the left picture, you can see Mount Baldy in the background. And I'll, I'll talk about that here in just a second. Okay, so if you can see the legend here, the purple is representing the old Forest Service database um, polygons, and the, the green polygons are representing what I found in my surveys, and then the yellow is just the area that I scouted. Um, once again, they were done in 2018 and 19. Um, I started out by searching for small known occurrences on the west side of Heliotrope, right down here on that southern one. It's hard to tell, but there's one tiny purple dot. That's where I originally started, and um, turns out I found quite a bit more than what was documented. And so I bounced around and came up here to there's a road up here that kind of takes you to the start of the heliotrope mountain hike and found a bunch more right there that added on to the to that existing population. Um, let's go a little bit further north. This is the furthest north one that's high top right along skyline drive and there was a couple populations that I wanted to check out and turns out they were much larger than than uh, previously documented. So, uh, and then jumping down here to the Southwest, this is Mount Baldy. And you can see that it has this donut shape. And the reason for that is Mount Baldy kind of has like a plateau top and it's all forested vegetation up there. And so that polygon is essentially representing our gravelly channer uh, sixty percent slope uh, habitat, and exactly where we saw those species. Um, next is this is Mucinia Peak, just south. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are aware of this, but there's a there's a faint line right here that represents the San Pete and Sevier County border. I, yeah, that's right. And then the Forest Service boundary between Manti LaSalle and Fish Lake uh, essentially crosses the very top of Mucinia Peak. And um, so we found another population there. And uh, from everything I've looked at, like I was saying, there was only known occurrences in San Pete. So now there's some in Severe, so that might be useful for other databases. Um, all right. Okay, so most of my time doing this work, I was dedicated to surveys just because I didn't have much time. Um, however, I did install a couple long-term uh, trend study plots 
within the Packer and Muse census. And in one of those, in one of those plots, I did a modified Dobmeier, which will give us species composition, species cover, and ground cover, um, as well as nested frequency using a 50 by 50 uh, meter frame uh, photo points. And I also did a soil petal on description. And you can see here, this is my plot layout. Um, so the five belt method was adopted from the Forest Service Handbook 2209 uh, 21 Chapter 40, which is the rangeland trend monitoring uh, ecosystem analysis. Uh, I've made some modifications to that protocol, like instead of being radially shaped and um, having set bearings for each belt, I actually had to modify my my belts to to meet these uh, these populations. Um, so essentially, I started. I'll show you in the. I believe it's the next picture. I started on top of a population and radiated down to get coverage across uh, most of the population. Um, and and here you can see on belt one, I have my modified Dobmeier and nested frequency frames. They are spread out every five feet and they start 10 feet from the reference point and then at 105. And the reason why they start 10 feet away from the reference point is just because when we, when we install the rebar and rocks, we don't want to disturb the area for, for our counting. Um, so just to get that frame a little further away from our disturbance. So we're collecting 20 frames of nested frequency and modified Dobmeyer each line. Um, that's 100 frames per plot and um, gives us a whole lot of information. And also just to mention that each of the belt ends are marked with rocks and rebar, um, just so we can, we can find those points again to reread these plots. All right. Um, on the left, rebar and rocks marks the reference point that can hopefully be uh, easy to find again. On the right is the modified Dobmeyer and nested frequency frame. Blue, the little small blue section you see here, this is for the nested frequency. This rep represents the value four. Purple is three, and then um, green is two and red is one. That's just giving our uh, our frequency values. So if it falls in the blue, it's obviously going to come out with a higher frequency number. Um, and also, we're collecting ground cover in this. So we drop a pin in each corner of the frame, and we're getting 400 points of ground cover data. So more than adequate there. OK, the picture of the plot. Once again, you can see Mount Baldy in that right picture. Um, and then the picture is just showing the belt stretched out. And we were very particular. We've seen a lot of belts in other studies that weren't very taut. And so in, our, in order to be replicable, we feel like it's a good idea to keep those, those belts nice and tight the way we like it. Um, all right, going on to the data. This is for high top. Um, as you can see, most of the plant cover and frequency in the plot came from Forbes. Uh, there was the one Tricetum spicatum grass that we did find. Uh, let me bring this one down, there we go. Um, the highest cover and frequency by species was Silene petersonii which is also uh, ranked as a, a G3 uh, under NatureServe. And let's see, we also had Aquilegia scopulorum, rock columbine. That's also another G3. But um, some things to point out here is that you can, you can notice Silene petersonii had the highest cover, but then when you look down at the nested frequency, there's obvious differences. Um, maybe it's in the other one. Yeah, it's in the other one. 
but the smaller statured plats, uh, plants are more represented in the nested frequency versus the cover, obviously. So uh, I just kind of want to see what types of protocols are going to give us the best information. And this was just a trial run. Uh, and actually, in the next plot, we didn't actually have time to do nested frequency. We only did modify a Dobmeyer. So moving on. OK, this ground cover is based on the Forest Service Handbook 2209-21, Chapter 40. And uh, these are the categories, vegetation, rock, bare soil, litter, pavement, and cryptograms. And what you can see is it's over 75% rock greater than three-fourths of an inch and pavement uh, an eighth to three-quarters. Um, this, doesn't, this doesn't really tell us uh, what we have above three quarters of an inch. Is it, is it up to a foot or like how big are we talk? Are we talking about boulders? So um, I'll talk about that here in a little bit. I think it's actually the next slide, the, the soil pit. Um, yeah. All right. So this is a USDA NRCS protocol that I've been using with uh, my monitoring. And I guess I can just start with some of the highlights here. As you can see, we're up here at elevation 10,008 subalpine conditions. Uh, aspect, what I've found from all of these surveys is that aspect's not really important for Pacara musiensis. It, it was found on all aspects, which I, my hypothesis was that I would find it more on south faces, but that, that wasn't true. Um, slope is definitely a factor. Um, 63%, I'm seeing slopes up to 80%. And then this is directly in Colluvium Flagstaff limestone, which could be a critical habitat element for this plant. Um, and then, so when I was talking about ground cover, this is the next portion that, that dives deeper to talk about what we actually have on the surface and where this plant grows. So the gravels, three, zero to three inches, we're almost 40%. And then, uh, excuse me, let me start with the highest one, which is channers. Channers are flat rocks, zero to six inches. Uh, that was about 60%. And then our second highest was gravel, zero to three inches. And that's also kind of what I was seeing with the, with the other plot. So it just seems like Packer Mew Census really likes these slopes and likes that percent substrate where your or surface fragments where it's a mixture of that gravel and channer composition. Um, Just a couple, couple minutes left, Dan. Okay, and then I'm in our A horizon. You can see that um, I did a soil pit here with the soil texture was sandy clay loam. And here in a minute, you'll see that um, my modeling didn't uh, is not representing what I found in this pit. Um, and then last thing I want to talk about in this slide is that this is an area highly concentrated with calcium carbonates, obviously with the limestone. Uh, so it had the highest rating of effervescence. And then I just wanted to show this real quick. This is just a few seconds. Uh, this is the most violent effervescence I've ever seen in, in my soil pits. So um, here's our next plot. This is on Mount Baldy. Uh, obviously, you can see that there's a little bit more rock here, but there was still a good population in the inner spaces of the channers and gravels. Um, here's the modified Dobmeyer. Um, it's kind of similar to the other ones, except for there's a couple shrub and tree species in there. And you can see that the Abies lasiocarpa was almost 11%, which is the second highest in there. But if we use nested frequency, that number would be drastically reduced. Um, so that's definitely something I would use next time. Ground cover, obviously, it's almost the same. Uh, next on Ridge Run Untermanii, you can see these down here, these uh, branch codices. Uh, that's a key characteristic of this. And uh, perennial pulvinate herb with branch codex up to eight centimeters tall. Leaves mainly basal, strigos, close hairs. Uh, let's see, Brax, Embercrit, 
suffused with purple villa spreading hairs found in meadows and escarpment edges in the in the flagstaff limestone or north horn formations um so on the picture on the right this is this is original and untermanized habitat it's mostly flat and then on the left picture it's up on top of those ridges it's not actually on those steep slopes and honestly you can see here that the gravel sizes are a lot smaller than what you can see in packer census um, the populations that I surveyed for right here, the pink and purple are old ones. I did not find them again. However, on the north side in this green, I did find a population there and then over here a tiny little population. So those are some updates. Um, once again, I did not install any long term monitoring trends in there, um, but hopefully somebody can do that in the future. Um, getting, getting close to the end here, soil map unit correlation. I did a ArcGIS exercise to determine, uh, I, I clipped the populations onto the soil map units. And these are both radar graphs showing which soil map units occurred or where the plants occur the most. And you can see that Pacron U census is liking 20 to 80% slopes the most, all aspects. And mostly on the Flagstaff formation, skeletal loams, mostly carbonatic. Um, Eridron and Tremanii, 0 to 30 percent slopes, all aspects, and it's on the North Horn formation mostly, skeletal loams, and more argo, uh, more clay soils with carbon addicts. Um, and then additional surveys and monitoring needed. Um, so I just want to give a shout out to Mindy Wheeler and her team in the Fish and Wildlife Service. I know they've been doing work with the Helio or um, Astragalus montii on the heliotrope. And also we have a partnership agreement with Mindy and her team to collect some of this information for our SEC. Um, obviously the south, the southern Wasatch Plateau is a really important place and I highly encourage organizations and people to get out there and monitor these populations so the Forest Service can better manage these because um, we don't have inf information on a lot of these species. Um, so it's a really important area to, to go out and monitor. Uh, that's all I've got. Hopefully I made my time.